Have any of you heard of the Thames River Monster? Back in the spring of 2016, a video found its way onto YouTube that was filmed in the London Borough of Greenwich. It showed what appears to be some kind of creature briefly surfacing and swimming around near the O2 Arena before sinking back beneath the murky surface. The video, which last I looked at, garnered over half a million views and hundreds of comments sent an uproar around the internet. It was picked up by publications as big as time and people all over the UK and indeed the world began to speculate what it was. Some thought that it might have been a whale which had ventured upriver from the ocean, while others speculated that it might be the famed Loch Ness Monster taking a vacation from its home in Scotland. More recently, a new picture emerged last year, taken by a man walking on the banks of the river. It shows what appears to be the head of the creature sticking part of its head out of the water, staring at the viewer with one red eye. Just like with the video, many decried the photo as nothing more than a hoax, or simply a picture of a rock or piece of wood that people blew out of proportion. However, when I look at that picture now, I can't help but shiver uncontrollably. Because as much as I wish I didn't, I know it's real. You see, I live in the medium-sized market town of Maidenhead, roughly around 30 miles to the west of London. I've lived here for the past 12 years after being transferred to the London office of my company from Los Angeles. After living for so long in the city, I wasn't in the mood to live in another. And so I moved here close enough that I can commute to work each day, but far enough away from the hustle and bustle that I could breathe. Many people have told me that the town's a shell of its former self, and while I admit that they may be right, it's still quiet enough for me. Compared to what I used to have to deal with in LA, nothing much really ever happens here. At least, it used to. It began roughly six or seven years ago. People began to complain about their pets going missing, in small numbers at first and then at increasing intervals. I'm friends with one of the local constables and over drinks one night in the pub, I found out about the rash of Houdini to pets, as he referred to them. It's the bloody oddest thing though, as he said between deep pulls of his whiskey. Nowhere else in town is having their animals vanish without a trace, only in and around the riverfront. When I questioned him as to why I hadn't seen anything written about the rash of disappearances in the Maidenhead advertiser, I was honestly a little shocked by what he said next. The department is set on keeping a lid on things. Until we know what's happening, at least. Last thing that we need to do is set the entire town in a panic. At the time, I simply took what he said as fact. I may not agree with it, but if it's what the police think is best, who am I to argue? In retrospect, however, I wish that I had pressed a little more, or just flat out leaked what I had been told. For the next few years, pets continued to vanish into thin air, though the rate slowed down. Whether that was because they were being taken less or people simply didn't allow them near the water as much though, I honestly don't know. The next big shoe to drop for me happened in 2019 as I was out jogging along the river on one of my days off. When the weather permitted, I often liked to jog back and forth between Maidenhead and Bourne End. The four and a half mile exercise would take me along a footpath which ran next to the Thames, allowing me some very peaceful views of the water and boats going by. Surprisingly though, not many people were out on the path with me something that I simply chalked it up to be in a weekday. However, as I entered a stretch of path that crossed somebody's field, I was a bit surprised to see what looked like two or three officers standing with who I could only assume was the landowner. I didn't slow my work out though, only assuming that they had had to have been called due to troublemaking teenagers or something. It wouldn't be the first time around here, with how bored they tend to get. My assumption died as I moved past them though, catching a brief snippet of their conversation. I understand what you're telling me, the man was saying, but you explained to me how a bleeding cow, something that is perfectly capable of swimming, could have just ran into the river and drowned. 
What? Did it decide that it was tired of living and took itself out? The words caused me to slow my pace to a walk and my mind began to race as I caught my breath. The missing pets flashed in my mind for the first time in months. This couldn't be connected to them, could they? I began to shake the thought away. There's no way it could, I thought. It's not even the same town anyways. But as I began to relax, the rising sound of the man's agitated yells drifted over to me. What do you mean I have to keep quiet about this? I've lost one of my cows and you're all worried about how other people will react to it. His words made me stop dead in my tracks and I feigned kneeling down to tie my shoe, stealing a quick glance over my shoulder. The three men had begun moving off, their words again becoming inaudible, though I could still hear the landowner's agitated tone. I stood up, feeling equal parts perplexed and uncertain. So it is connected, but dogs and cats are one thing. Who or what would take an entire cow? As I stared at the retreating backs of the three, a feeling washed over me like a wave, causing a large shiver to shoot up my spine. I stiffened like a board as I recognized the sensation. It was the feeling of being watched. Slowly I turned to look around. The walking path was empty in both directions that I could see and staring across the river, I saw no one standing on the opposite bank. A second shiver passed through me and for reasons that I couldn't understand at the time, I began to feel extremely vulnerable out in the open. Alone. And finally, my eyes drifted down to the river itself and its murky waters concealing whatever lay beneath them. A third shiver made me begin moving again, slow at first and then increasing until I was rapidly jogging away from the spot. All the while, the feeling of being intensely watched remained. It only disappeared when I got about half a mile away. To this day, I've never forgotten how eerie the sensation of being looked at by something that I couldn't see was. Eerie and honestly fear-inducing. The realization that whatever was happening was occurring not just in town but farther out made me begin to dig a little. The police were truly doing a tremendous job at suppressing any stories from getting out even going to the local library and digging back through newspaper articles from years ago. I found not even a single mention of any pet vanishing. However, when I accidentally opened a book containing historical newspaper clippings while digging, I did find two articles which made something uncoil itself inside of me. The two clippings were from well over half a century ago, the first from 1947 and the second from 1954. I would have slammed the book shut if it had not been for the large bold headlines that caught my eye. Four people unaccounted for after floodwaters recede, proclaimed the 1947 clipping. Two children reported missing during flooding, said the one from 54. I sat straight up in my seat, unable to keep from shivering slightly as I tried to brush away the dots that my mind was connecting. Not get a grip, Marshall, just because people disappeared long ago during flooding does not mean that it has anything to do with the pets and that cow going missing. Remember what your old college professor always hounded you about. Correlation does not equal causation. I closed the book and placed it back on the shelf, beginning to head for the exit. And besides, I thought, it's only animals that have gone missing, not people. And little did I know what was coming next. I attempted to push the entire ordeal from my mind, helped by the fact that a very time-sensitive project had landed in my lap at work. For the next few months, I immersed myself in work, letting any and all thoughts of the matter drift to the back of my mind. Just as the project was beginning to wind down, something else flew along to take its place. The pandemic. Like the rest of the world made in head and the rest of the country went into lockdown. Leaving home was done only for essential travel and I began to work from home, attending meetings via webcam like everybody else. During that time, I didn't hear anything more about anything disappearing, likely due to people and animals remaining shut up inside their houses. In retrospect though, 
I know that it was still happening. It was just that there wasn't many, if any, who saw it. The next I heard of the situation was in the summer of 2022, and it was when things truly ramped up for me. Nigel, my constable friend, and I were finally able to meet up again for drinks, choosing to meet at the Crown and Bray for a change in scenery. As we caught each other up with what had happened over the last few years over pints and dinner, I saw that something weighed heavily on the man's mind. Finally, I gently broached the subject. Nigel, man, what's up? You look like a man with weight on his shoulders. For a few moments, he seemed to fight with himself before answering. If I tell you something, can you promise to keep it between us? He asked, dropping his voice to an almost inaudible whisper as he shot looks around as if he were afraid of being overheard. Of course, I answered, cocking an eyebrow at him as I popped another chip into my mouth. He again seemed to fight with himself and then spoke again. Remember the missing animals I told you about a few years ago? I nodded. It's not just them that are disappearing anymore. I jerked my head up to lock eyes with him as shock filled me. For a moment I couldn't speak and then I forced the word from my lips. What? He nodded somberly and then took a large pull of his drink before leaning in again. When the pandemic started, we received our first missing persons call. An elderly woman who broke the rules and went out for a walk along the river late one night. Nobody heard from her again and it wasn't until her grandson rang us that anybody knew. He shook his head. We never found any trace of her and she was only the first. The last two years, we've had five people her included, completely vanished by the riverfront. Nobody in the department knows what's happening to them. He shot another wary look around before finishing, or at least is saying anything. But Nigel, this is far more serious than animals vanishing, man, I pressed. These are people who are up and vanishing like they just walked into the Bermuda Triangle or something. I mean, heck, for all you know, we've got some kind of killer or kidnapper on the loose. The cops have to tell the townsfolk what's happening. My friend shook his head slowly. I've said the exact same thing to them, mate, he began. But the answer's always been the same thing every time. Telling them would lead to a mass panic situation, which after what happened the last few years, we cannot allow, end quote. And if any of us try to say anything... They made it quite clear that we'll lose our jobs and have our names smeared to boot. I ran a hand through my hair, thoughts racing through my mind like a Formula One car. Finally, I sighed and asked the only question that I could think to. What is actually going on around here? I really don't know, Marshall. He answered before giving me a serious look. But my advice as your friend, do your best to stay out of it. This is far bigger than you can imagine. I turned the man's words over in my head for a few days. He hadn't seemed like he was threatening or trying to intimidate me. He was merely a friend trying to look out for me. And so, as much as the mental image of those old newspaper clippings haunted me, as much as my mind has screamed at me to do anything, I pushed it away attempting to take Nigel's advice. I became lost in my work again, and honestly... I likely would have dropped it then and there had it not been for what happened next. One late night in August, I found myself walking along Ray Mead Road towards my flat building. I hadn't been able to sleep and thus had decided to take a long walk to try and tire myself out. Insomnia was something that I frequently dealt with and the only way that I found I could make myself sleep during such bouts was to physically drain my energy. The street lamps cast small circles of light down upon me as I walked next to the black railing, occasionally sparing glances at the dark water below. Every time that I walked by the river now, I couldn't help but feel the same creepy sensation that I had had that day in the field, a being watched, scrutinized even. But I reasoned that as long as I was up here with the railing between me and it, that I was safe. As I drew within sight of my flat, however, a cry cut through the stillness. Somebody help! I froze like a statue at the yell for a moment and then began sprinting forward, 
The voice, which sounded like a young man's voice, came again. Anybody please help. As I approached an area which served as a mooring area for a small boat, I saw what looked like two teenage boys standing near the railing. The terrified looks on their faces as they turned towards me sent a new chill through me. What's going on? I demanded. The two boys stumbled over their words for a moment and then one pointed at the stairs. Our maid, he was just goofing over at the steps. We all were, after being out having fun. The second spoke up. He was standing on the steps when he slipped and fell in. He came up for a moment, a ways away, it must have been carried by the current. And then he let out a yell and disappeared under the water. The first grabbed my arm in almost a death grip. Please, sir, you have to help him. My mind raised. Okay, the police won't be here in time. They have to be called, though. I made my mind up, pulling my cell phone from my pocket and thrusting it in the teen's hand. Call the cops right now. I ordered as I stripped off my jacket, kicking off my shoes as well. What are you doing? The second asked, voice still frantic. I'm going in to try and find him, I answered. And then I stepped over the small sign proclaiming, Do Not Enter, which was held over the exit to the street by chain. For a moment, I stood at the top of the stairs, staring down at the water. A potent mixture of anxiety and to a small extent, fear rushed into me. But I couldn't waste time on emotions. The kid's life depended on it. I dove. The water was surprisingly cold for summertime even at night. It stabbed into my exposed skin like multiple knife blades as it enveloped me. For a few moments I was blind, pushing my way through the dark water towards what I hoped was the surface, and then my head broke into the air. Immediately I heard the sound of one of the teens frantically speaking on the phone. Okay good, he got through. Turning, I saw the second was staring down at me. I slowly began to swim against the current which was stronger than I had first thought it would be in order to stay in place. Why did you last see him? I called out, sputtering water from my mouth. The kid stabbed an emphatic finger behind me and slightly downriver. Over there, he called back. I turned, judging approximately where he had pointed and began to swim. Thank God I was on the swim team in high school and college, I thought. The current was already working my muscles and I made my way to the area. Taking a deep breath, I dove under and, unable to see anything, began to feel around with my hands. I prayed that I would feel the brush of the teen's clothing or hair, but there was nothing. I surfaced, noting that I had drifted a small distance from my original dive point. I could still clearly see the teens, but they now appeared to be a little further away. Before they could ask me if I found anything, I took another deep breath and dove again. My hands aimlessly reached out, fingers grasping for any purchase. How deep is this river anyways? As my lungs began to burn and scream for oxygen though, my left hand finally did brush up against something. But I instantly knew it that it wasn't the kid. Neither hair nor human skin or clothing had the feeling that slid across my palm. And it wasn't the bottom either. This was something else entirely. A giant shiver passed through my body and for a moment I froze, feeling the current begin carrying me away. I hated how with even my eyes wide open I couldn't see my own hand in front of my face. I felt more vulnerable than I ever had in my life, and the worst part was that the feeling of being watched was back. At a time and place that made me feel not just creeped out but full on terrified, I didn't wait for anything else to happen. I just kicked to the surface. As soon as my head broke into the air, a new sound had reached my ears. It was somebody calling to me, but it wasn't either of the teens. Blinking the water from my eyes, I saw that an officer was now standing between the two. He leaned over the railing, his eyes finding me. Sir, get back over here right now, he yelled, waving an arm for me to swim back. For a moment, even with the strange, fear-inducing encounter that I had had underwater, the mental image of the boy's drowning figure danced in my mind, overriding everything else as my old lifeguard instincts reared their head again. The boy's still down here somewhere, I have to find him. I yelled, preparing to dive again. 
and that was when the officer yelled, his voice more frantic than I had ever heard a cop speak. Get the heck out of the water now! The man's tone made me look up at him, and what I saw chilled me to the bone. His face looked almost ashen in the glow of the nearby street lamp. He wasn't afraid he was beyond terrified and not for himself. It felt like all the blood in my veins turned to ice as the realization hit me. Oh crap. I didn't think beyond that. I simply began pouring on the power as I drove my arms and legs through the water towards where I had entered. As I got halfway back though, a surge of water suddenly rose up from beneath and almost directly behind me. I felt the push of it sweep upwards against my legs and feet, moving forward and out to the side before vanishing, and it caused a long forgotten memory to surge forward in my mind. A memory of sitting on my old surfboard in Santa Monica as I waited for the next set of waves, feeling a similar sensation race under my feet as I did and turning to see a massive great white shark had flashed by under me, having taken what I can only describe as a test lunge at me. The connection caused a new emotion to flood every inch of my body, one that I hadn't felt since that fateful day. Horror. Something just took a freaking practice swing at snatching me. The surge of adrenaline that came with it powered me on, making me swim faster than I ever have in competitions. I was terrified that at any moment I would feel something seize me and drag me underwater to an unimaginable fate. As I drew close to the stairs, I risked a look up. The officer was standing near the water's edge, arm held out as an equally terrified look to what I felt adorned his face. Come on sir, grab my hand, he ordered. With the last burst of strength that I had in me, I kicked hard and reached out feeling his fingers close around my wrist as he practically wrenched me out of the water. For a few moments, I simply lay in a crumpled heap on the stairs, breathing heavily and unable to stop shaking, as the memory of what I felt brush against my hand in the water's surge played over and over in my mind. And then I spared a look up at the much relieved face of the cop. You mate have no idea how lucky you are, he said wiping sweat from his brow. The next few hours were a blur, figuratively and literally. The officer hauled both myself and the two teens to the station, where we were split up into three interview rooms and gave statements as to what had happened, what each of us had seen. After a little while into my surprise, Nigel came into the room and gave me a change of dry clothes to change into. But what made my heart sink was the fact that he wouldn't even meet my eyes. And he refused to answer any of my questions about what was happening. Finally, half an hour later, the door opened and who I can only assume was one of the senior officers had entered. After taking a final statement from me, he gave me a long, serious look. And before I let you leave, Mr. Blake, I need to stress something to you. I shot him a look as I pulled on the coat that I had been given. The man's next word stopped me dead though. None of what you just told us will ever be spoken about outside of the station. My head jerked up to look at him, disbelief filling me. Excuse me? I asked. He nodded. None of what any of you three have told us will ever find its way out of this building. You will not go to the press and tell them anything, nor will you start telling others in town. He narrowed his eyes at me. I understand you're an American over here on a business visa. You've been here for a fair few years now with no record or history of trouble. You're an upstanding citizen of the highest quality. However, if you don't obey this order and attempt to say anything to anyone, that can change. And you will be shocked at how quickly you'll be deported back to America. I felt my jaw drop open as I stared at him. I was speechless. Are you kidding me? The man took my silence as acknowledgement, standing and moving for the door. But he stopped, turning back to cast a final icy look at me. And you will also no longer be seeing Constable Ackerson either. He's being transferred over to Swindon, I'm afraid. And with that he left, leaving the door open for me to exit. 
Instantly, I knew the man had found out either directly from Nigel or another source what he had told me. His transfer was punishment for it. And so, I left the station picking up my cell phone at the front desk, having been returned from the teenager. I quickly made my way back to my flat, refusing to look at the river and walking on the other side of the street as I reached Ray Mead Road. Inconsolable rage was beginning to build up inside of me. These idiots are taking the disappearance of animals of people likely by whatever is in the river and just sweeping it under the rug for whatever reason. And if those old newspaper clippings are in fact connected, this has been going on for close to a century if not longer. The thought made a plan begin to form in my mind. I should have realized that they had already thought of it. When I returned to the library the next day, I found that I couldn't find either of the newspaper clippings. There was a blank page where they had once been held, showing they had realized their error and cleaned up and it made the rage that I felt burn even brighter. A new plan began to form in my mind, one that part of me knew was incredibly stupid, but the rest didn't care. Those people aren't going to die with no one knowing what really happened to them, if I have anything to say about it. And that thing will be exposed to the world. And with the idea firmly in my mind, I began to gather the supplies that I needed. I knew my plan to get proof was dangerous. What I didn't know though was that in a few nights time, I would come face to face with a horror beyond my understanding or comprehension. One that would almost be the last thing I ever saw. As much as I wanted to get going on my plan right away, the truth was that it took me a few days to gather all the supplies that I thought that I would need. I didn't dare purchase anything from these shops in Maidenhead. The police were likely already keeping close tabs on me after my interview that night, and the last thing that I wanted was for them to catch wind and attempt to stop me. Instead, every evening after I finished work in London, I would swing through the shops there picking up a few items at a time before driving back home. By Thursday, I had managed to acquire a rather sturdy kayak along with a few underwater cameras, waterproof lights, and a fishing rod. And part of me wished that I could have bought a bigger boat. I felt sure the monster in the river could easily flip it if it wanted to, but it was the only thing I knew I could stealthily slide in and out of the Thames without attracting attention. I had also decided that I would take one of the largest knives from my cutlery set as a last resort defense, if it came to that. I was in the middle of finalizing my plans when my phone rang. Picking it up, I saw with a pang of surprise that Nigel's name was displayed on the caller ID screen. I quickly hit the accept button and pressed the phone to my ear. Hello? For a moment there was no response and then the man's voice filtered through the speaker. Marshall. He paused for a moment, letting out a sigh before continuing. Mate, I'm so sorry for what happened a few nights ago. I didn't think they would go quite that hard on you. I let out a sigh of my own. Uh, don't worry about it, man. I know it wasn't exactly your choice anyways. And I'm sorry as well. If I'm the reason you're being transferred over to Swindon. The sound of a snort came from the other end of the line. Nah, that wasn't you. I should have been smart enough to realize that they would have had someone tailing me everywhere to make sure that I didn't flap my gums. I hesitated for a moment. The urge to tell him what I was going to do was strong and he was my closest friend here. Finally, I gave in. I'm going after it, Nigel. For a few moments, there was such a silence on the other end of the line that I thought the call had been disconnected. And then the man's voice returned to barely above a whisper. What? I took a deep breath and then continued. Just what I said, man, I'm going after it tomorrow evening. Not to kill it, you would need a double-barreled shotgun or more at the very least to even try to hurt it. No, I'm going to after to try and get proof. More silence on Nigel's end and then he let out another sigh. Well, then I'm going with you, mate. The man's words surprised me to the point of speechlessness. Before I could even attempt to argue, he continued. And don't try and talk me out of this. 
I know there's no talking you out of it, and there's no way that I'm letting you go after that bloody monster by yourself. Just shoot me the details before the end of the day, and I'll bring my kayak to wherever we're starting the search. And with that, he clicked off. I slowly pulled the phone away from my ear, staring at it with my mouth hanging open slightly. Holy heck, I didn't expect that. I expected a million one possible ways that he might try and talk me out of it, but I didn't expect him to jump feet first into help. A new wave of gratitude washed over me as I, not for the first time, realized just how good a friend the man was. I ran my hand through my hair and stood up, moving to the sliding door to the flat's balcony. The cool breeze felt good against my face as I slid the glass back and stepped outside. My mind churned as I mentally began rearranging the plan to accommodate for the presence of a second person. This might actually be a good thing, I thought. With a second person, it means it'll be harder for anyone to sneak up on us. Having somebody to watch your back is infinitely safer than going solo. As I stood there, leaning against the railing and thinking, a shiver suddenly shot through me. It blindsided me with how out of nowhere it had come from, and I stood up straight, staring around and down at the parking lot below. For a moment, my eyes shifted to the gloomy corners of the lot. I wondered if, like with Nigel, the higher-ups had people watching me at all times now. It would make sense with them wanting me to stay silent, but I saw no one. The shiver came again, and with it came a sweeping, stomach-dropping feeling of dread because it suddenly dawned on me that I had had the exact same sensation a few years ago, standing on the bank of the Thames after hearing the man talk about his cow disappearing. And being certain that I was being watched, slowly my eyes lifted and moving across the parking lot across Raymead Road to the dark water. Shivering a third time as the potent mixture of anxiety and fear rose, I slowly stepped back inside and closed the sliding door, choosing for the first time in a while to close the blinds as well. The feeling disappeared immediately and I let out a relieved sigh before turning back to the couch and coffee table. I had final preparations to make. The next day passed by in a blur. I spent most of it texting the finalized plan back and forth with Nigel. The sight of our starting point was firm in my mind. Even though I felt certain that the creature had no problem moving great distances up and down the Thames, as was proven by the incident near Bourne End years ago, I felt certain that its main haunt was much closer to home. In fact, I had a hunch that the half-mile span of waterway between Maidenhead Bridge and Bolter's Lock, possibly extending down to the railway bridge, was where I would have the best chance of coming across it. I would wait until the sun began to lower in the sky and then bring my kayaking gear to meet the man at the bridge gardens. As I waited, I fully admit that the horror that I had felt, finding myself in the water with it that night returned, haunting me like some kind of vengeful specter. But I refused to budge. This is the only way anyone will ever know the truth. There's no backing out now. I wish in retrospect that I had listened to my gut. That will haunt me for the rest of my life. A few hours later, I pulled my Land Rover into the parking lot of the Texaco station opposite the park. Shutting off the engine, I spared a glance at my watch. 5.45pm. I should be hearing from Nigel in about 15 minutes. Stepping out of the SUV, I used the time to detach the kayak from the roof, setting it down next to the driver's door and piling the rest of my supplies inside. A small pang of anxiety shot through me as I kept shooting looks at my watch, seeing the minutes slowly dragging by. Man, I seriously hope that he doesn't flake on me or get caught. As determined as I am, even if I have to admit the idea of getting into that river, knowing what lurks beneath, scares the ever-living crap out of me. My worries were dispelled a moment later as I felt my phone vibrate in my pocket. Pulling it out, I felt relief sweep through me as I saw that he had arrived. Picking up the kayak and paddle, I jogged across the street and entered the park. Winding my way along the paths, I stopped to catch my breath near the fountain trough in the center for a moment, shooting glances around and behind me. I couldn't help but feel a little bit paranoid, 
half afraid that I would suddenly be swarmed by corrupt officers who had followed me. And but the park thankfully remained silent and empty. I let out a shaky breath and then picked the kayak back up and continued down to the water. And Nigel was already waiting for me by the steps, his own kayak sitting by his feet. He was fumbling with something on his waist and as I approached him he started, tugging down on his shirt and jacket. Oh, oh, it's only you, Marshall, he said, letting out a loud whoosh of air. I allowed a small smile to crack on my face. Well, who else do you think it would be, Patrick Allen? A snort of laughter escaped the man. Mate, you need to update your references. Nobody our age except cinephiles are going to have any idea who that is, I shrugged. Hey, I got you to laugh and relax a little, didn't I? He nodded and then turned to Sirius, gesturing towards the water. So you're ready. Like a balloon being popped, the levity burst allowing the anxiety and fear to rush back in as I turned to stare at the ever-darkening water. Finally, I spoke. Yeah, let's go. The two of us slid our kayaks into the water, climbing rather clumsily into them and pushing off. We headed in the direction of the railway bridge, away from Bolter's Lock. We would start our sweep up there, slowly making our way back down towards it. Each of us now had four GoPro cameras mounted on our kayaks. Two were mounted on the bow and stern of a small boat, while two others in waterproof housings were stuck to the undersides, also facing in opposite directions underwater. Small but powerful LED lights had also been stuck to the undersides, meaning that anything that came near the kayaks would be caught clearly on camera, while we each had powerful flashlights to aim up top. I slid my paddle into the water, pushing as hard and gently as I could to avoid making too much noise. I didn't need unwanted attention until we were squarely in place. Every second or third paddle I would swivel my head around like I was an owl, attempting to shoot looks in all directions for any sign of a splash or movement to be on the norm. But nothing seemed to disturb the slowly moving surface of the Thames. Far from helping me relax, I instead felt the tendrils of anxiety, paranoia, and dread begin to increase inside of me as darkness slowly began to spread across the river. This thing could be anywhere, even directly under you, and you wouldn't even know. The thought made me snap my head down to look in the water. Nothing stirred in the illumination provided by the underwater lights. Hey, is everything alright? Came a whisper and I looked up to see Nigel staring back at me, an expression identical to what I felt visible on his face. Yeah, I'm fine man, just keep going. He nodded but I saw him nervously cast another look at the water. As we rounded the top of Guard Club's island, swinging round to begin moving back up the river to begin our sweep, a sudden ear-piercing sound caused me to almost jump out of the kayak's cockpit. For a few moments, my mind was unable to process what it was as blind panic overtook me. And then it suddenly clicked as the whistle came again, along with the sound of clanging on the railway tracks directly over our heads. The train. It's the freaking evening train coming into town. I let out a shaky, shuddering breath which was followed by a short, tense laugh. I heard Nigel let out an equally nerve-wracked chuckle. I scared the devil out of both of us, I see, he called. And that's one way to phrase it. I replied and then shot a glance ahead and to the right, where a flash of red near the waterline caught my eye. What the? I knew it hadn't been light reflecting off of anything. None of the pylons along the shore had reflectors on them, and the only other light that I could see shone from the windows of the houses along the banks, white and soft yellow. So what the heck had I seen? A shudder suddenly ran through me and I fumbled for the flashlights in my lap, almost dropping it into the water. Snapping it on, I quickly aimed it where I had seen the red flash. Nothing was there. A mixture of confusion and wariness wafted into my mind as I continued to shine the light around for a second. But the beam found nothing except speedboats and narrow boats moored at the river's edge. Did, 
Did I just see things? Am I getting so paranoid that I'm beginning to hallucinate? I shook my head. Now focus, Marshall. You can't lose your cool now. Losing it would be a fatal mistake. I snapped the light off, turning to Nigel who wore a questioning look on his face. I thought I saw something is all. Come on, let's keep moving. For the next 20 minutes, the two of us slowly paddled back up the river towards the lock. We slid underneath the main bridge, crisscrossing from one side of the Thames to the other. Sounds drifted out to us from the town around us. The sound of music came from one of the houses along the bank. A police car siren began wailing from somewhere closer to the town center, and the occasional hum of a boat's generator filtered from the boat's moored to either side of us. But nothing else broke the stillness except the sounds of our paddles dipping in the water. I kept watch, much more vigilantly now, shooting glances to either side. With each stroke we took towards the lock, my dread and paranoia grew. It crescendoed as we finally reached the spot that I had dove in after the doomed teenager. The memory of feeling the water surge under me, along with what I had touched in the dark, fueled it even further. But still nothing seemed to disturb the water's surface. I began to wonder if we might have picked the wrong night to try and find the creature. Maybe it decided to head to Bourne End, or hack even further downstream. We might be out here half the night for nothing. I felt a bit ashamed that the thought brought me more of a sense of relief than disappointment. Nigel seemed to read my thoughts as we drew even with Woodhurst, sparing a glance over at my flat building. Mate, I hate to say it, but I think it's headed elsewhere for the night. I'm sorry, but I don't think you're getting proof tonight. The man's words felt a bit like a punch to the gut and I felt myself begin to deflate. Eh, you might be right, man, I said, and then shot a glance ahead. What the heck, why not? I spoke again. How about we just shoot quickly up by the weir, and then we'll turn around and head back to the park and call it a night. The man's voice immediately answered, and I heard the plain relief in his voice. It sounds like a plan to me, Marshall. He began to paddle forwards, leading the way as I followed. As we approached Raymill Island, the river split off in two directions. To the left and caught in the glow of the street lamps on the road above, I could see the large black doors which marked the entrance to Bolter's Lock, where boats would enter and have the water raised or lowered to allow passage through. To the right, clad more in darkness, was the stretch of water that would lead to the weir itself. We headed to the right. The low thundering sound of the water rushing down from the river above began to reach my ears as we drew closer to a walkway bridge that ran overhead. I let out a final sigh as we slid underneath it. I knew for a fact the water got shallower up near the weir, too shallow for anything monstrous to hide. Hey Nigel, I called out. I saw him stop paddling, turning to look at me. Yeah? I began to open my mouth to answer him and that's when something bumped against my kayak from below. My blood ran cold as I felt the stern rise slightly out of the water, and I whirled around in my seat, eyes wide and searching. For a split second, I saw the shadow of something moving quickly away, retreating back into the darkness. Something massive. The water became still once more, but I knew that I hadn't imagined things this time. All the terror that I had felt a few days ago returned with a vengeance. It's here. Instantly I realized just how foolish and dumb my plan had been. You idiot. This is like going after a lion with a pork shop hung around your neck. Get out of the water. I swallowed hard before speaking again. My voice came out high and squeaky. Uh, Nigel... The man must have immediately noticed the change in my voice because when he answered, his voice was deadly serious. What is it, Marshall? I took another shaky breath. Oh, we're not alone out here anymore, I forced out. For a second, there was silence. Oh, heck, he breathed. Even though I knew he couldn't see me, I nodded. I suddenly get the feeling that we're in over our heads here, man. We need to get our butts to shore now. 
The fear between the two of us now was so palpable that you could have cut it from the air with a knife. Still, he kept his voice level and calm. There's no way to climb up onto the island where we are. We have to turn around and paddle back towards where the fork in the river is. Back to where the docks by the boathouse are. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw him allow the water to slowly begin carrying him back downstream. The bow of his kayak coming about. Just let the water turn you around, and then as calmly as you can paddle. We don't want to give it a reason to rush us. I felt like my heart would stop and I would die of fear at any moment. I could practically hear the pounding of it in my ears even over the crash of water ahead. And still I listened to the man allowing the water to pull my kayak backwards. Slowly, almost painfully so, my bow swung around until I pointed back the way that we had come. All the while, the horrific feeling of being watched hung around my neck like a noose. Watched by something which was sizing us up for supper. Slowly, I dipped my paddle into the water and pushed, following Nigel who was now about a boat length or two ahead of me. The seconds felt like hours as we made our way towards our salvation. Splashing sounds began to come from behind us and it took every ounce of willpower in me to not look back. Finally, we rounded the corner under the footbridge again, and my eyes began to well with tears of relief as I saw the dock slide into view. We're gonna make it, we're gonna make it, allowing a small smile to cross my face. I glanced around one more time, casting a last look down into the water, and I felt all the hope wash away like a loved one swept overboard in a storm, because it stared up at me a few feet below the surface. Even in the glow of the underwater lights, I couldn't see it perfectly, but it was enough to make me want to scream. The head of one as wide across as my coffee table reminded me of the head of a salamander, except no salamander has red eyes. Eyes that reflected back in the light, and none have long, needle-like looking teeth jutting from their mouths. A whimper escaped my lips. Oh God. From the corner of my eye, I saw Nigel slowly turn around, but it was as if I had been frozen in place. I could only look down and watch in horror as the head slowly rose up towards me, revealing its massive body behind it as it began to open its mouth. I began to shake uncontrollably. And that's when with a flick of its tail it suddenly shot forward, out of the glow from my lights. For a moment my mind couldn't comprehend what had happened, and then the horrific realization hit me like a freight train. I snapped my head up. Nigel, look out! But my warning came a moment too late. What happened next is a blur. The only way to describe it is, if you've ever seen the film Lake Placid and remember the scene where the canoe that Bridget Fonda and Brendan Gleeson were in was literally flipped up in the air and over. Well, that's what happened to Nigel. One second he was sitting there, I remember seeing the look of horror flash across his face as he realized what was about to happen. And the next, his kayak was slammed up and out of the water, flipping upside down as he disappeared beneath the churning surface. I screamed at the man's name again, but no answer came. And worse, his head didn't break the water's surface. I shot a glance over at the dock now less than 15 feet away. It would be so easy to quickly paddle and reach it while the beast was preoccupied. But I couldn't. I couldn't just abandon my friend even if it was too late for him as the animalistic side of my mind screamed. I had to try and save him. After all, if it had been me that had just been flipped, I knew that he would have dived in after me. I grabbed the large kitchen knife from where I had stowed it, along with the waterproof flashlight. As I saw the water around, Nigel's kayak begin to froth, I stood up, the kayak beginning to tap. I took a final deep breath, saying a quick silent prayer that I would live to breathe the air again, and dove. The water was as bitingly cold as it had been the last time that I had been in it, making me almost expel my breath as I slid headfirst underwater. The only thing that kept me going was sheer determination. Fighting the urge to surface, I powered forward, kicking forward towards the fray and readying the knife in my hand. With the other, I snapped the light on, the brightest heck beam cutting through the dark water. 
My kayak drifted over me, the underwater lights banishing away more of the gloom, revealing a sight that I wish I had never seen, one that will haunt my dreams until the day I die. The beast had to have been at least 30 or 40 feet long. Its tail was pressed firmly against the bottom, stretching away into the dark. Black, slimy-looking skin reflected back in my light, as did the single red eye that momentarily flashed to look at me. It stretched up from the bottom towards the surface, towards the overturned kayak, where its mouth was clasped firmly around something. No, not just something. Someone. Instantly, I knew that Nigel was dead. The amount of blood that clouded around the nightmarish sight was proof of that. No person could lose that much blood and survive. And as the realization hit me, another more terrifying one came hot on its heels. The thing is eating him. And I'm next. That last thought was what snapped me from my horrified stupor. I turned and kicked desperately for the surface my light revealing the creature beginning to drop from its meal as its attention focused on me. I saw the dark outlines of the dock pylons in front of me. Sparing a glance up, I saw the underside of it just a few feet above my head. I kicked harder and then spared a glance to the side, and I screamed, bubbles exploding from my mouth towards the surface. My light reflected off a mouth opened wider than I thought possible. Translucent, needle-like teeth rushed forward to pierce me as the beast lunged forward. I didn't think, running on pure instinct as I forced myself down towards the bottom of the river. Not a moment too soon either. The jaw snapped shut less than a foot over my head, the momentum beginning to carry it past me. One giant red eye glared down at me as it slid by, enraged that its next meal had outwitted it. As I stared at it, a rage unlike anything that I've ever felt, even stronger than I had felt for the cops which had covered up this monster's existence, began welling up inside of me. This thing had been around devouring people in the river for God knows how long. It's eaten people, pets, and livestock. And it just killed the best friend that I had in this place. That final thought made me bring my right hand up. The hand that was still clutching the knife, knuckles turned white from the death grip that I had on it. I angled the knife upwards and jabbed. The creature didn't let out any sort of cry as the knife stabbed into its eye, piercing it and filling the water with a strange blue fluid. But it did recoil, turning and swimming quickly away into the safety of the gloom. As soon as it disappeared, my mind shifted focus, and I began racing for the surface. I knew that I hadn't killed it as much of a blow as I had dealt. All I had done was infuriate it. A few moments later, my head broke the surface, sputtering water from my mouth as I raced for the dock. My fingers scrabbled at the wood as I felt the water pressure change around me. It's coming back. The thought gave me the burst of strength that I needed. My fingers found purchase and I hauled myself up onto the dock. For a second, I lay on my side gasping for air. And then before sheer exhaustion could take hold, I forced myself to my feet and ran for the steps up to the front door of the restaurant above, because I knew I needed to get away from the water, from it. I reached the stairs and collapsed onto them, the adrenaline beginning to wear off as my body began to uncontrollably shake from fear. My breath came in ragged gasps as I began to sob, both for myself and Nigel. That horrific night was almost a year and a half ago now. I was never able to get the proof that I had wanted. No trace of my kayak or Nigel's was ever found, even when I reported that mine had been stolen, hoping it would turn up on the bank downstream somewhere. I have no doubt that that monster tore both of them to shreds in a rage at what I had done to it. And that's what makes everything worse, I think. Nigel died for nothing, I almost died for nothing, and it's still out there. I still live in Maidenhead, at least for the moment. I immediately got rid of my flat in Woodhurst and moved to a place closer to the center of town, away from the Thames. I can't even look at it now for more than a few moments before I feel like I want to scream. A few weeks ago, I got an offer from my company to transfer back to the States, and honestly, I think I'm going to take it. I want to try and forget, 
even if it means that I have to drink myself to death to do so. And that brings me to why I'm telling you this. Why I decided to write about what happened and post it here for all of you to read. Well, it's to warn you. You see, I honestly never would have said anything about that horrific night. About the creature at all. Because ever since that night, pets have stopped going missing from near the river around Maidenhead. And so have people. For a while, I felt sure that my wounding it had driven it off. That I would never hear anything about it again. Until I came across a post on Reddit a few weeks ago. One of a picture taken earlier in the year taken on the banks of the Thames near London. The image is blurry but it shows something horrifyingly familiar to me. Something which is sticking its head as slightly out of the water, gazing at the viewer with what appears to be a glaring red eye. It's one remaining red eye. You all need to listen to me please, all of you who live along the shores of the Thames. Something truly monstrous lives in the river's waters. Something that has been around for close to 80 years if not longer. Something that has taken generations of people and animals over that time. Something which the people who know about it have covered up. Something that likely has gotten much more vicious since my escape from it. Something that is still out there gliding and stalking below the murky surface. It doesn't matter whether you're in London or farther out. Nowhere near the river is safe. And I don't just mean in the river. I mean anywhere near it. You see, there's one thing that I haven't told you yet. That night, when I made it to the stairs and collapsed, I heard a giant splash come from behind me. I turned to see one final horrific sight. One that was far more blood chilling than anything else I had seen. Something that made me sprint back to my flat in blind terror. I saw it begin to climb out of the water onto the dock after me, using its feet to pull itself up.